morning. I'm so glad to see you all this morning. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a blessing and an honor to welcome you to God's house at Haymarket Baptist Church. We hope that our offering of worship today will be pleasing to the Lord and to you as well. I'd like to um, ask you to notice the black attendance pads in each row. If you wouldn't mind filling out the information requested there and passing it to your neighbor so that we may have a record of your attendance in this day. I'd like to go over some announcements. Uh, not many this week. It's a pretty slow week. Um, I'm happy to tell you that next Sunday you get an extra hour of sleep. So make sure Saturday night before you go to bed you set your clocks back because daylight savings time will end. Also this Wednesday evening there are no activities including dinner, prayer meeting, and Bible study, and choir practice. So take this Wednesday off. And uh, Madison Kate, are you here? All right. Madison Kate is having a brother uh, next month, and we are going to have a churchwide baby shower for her brother and her mom, Brittany Elkins, on November the 18th. So there'll be some uh, information in the bulletin starting next week about that. But this is Madison Kate, and she is going to be a big sister for the first time. So very exciting. Let us now stand up and greet one another in Christian love. <laughs> Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. I wanted to thank all of you who have kept me in your prayers for this last week. I got to drive all the way to Brooklyn and back from Brooklyn and then uh, with my daughter Kristen uh, we had a road trip all the way to Des Moines, Iowa and uh, got to drop her off. She is going to be the new assistant U.S. attorney in Des Moines, Iowa. So. Uh, it was not an easy drive, but it was delightful spending time with my daughter in that way. So thank you. I know a lot of you kept me in your prayers, and it's nice to be back home safe. All right. Um, we now begin to shift our attention away from one another and turn our focus uh, on the Lord. So let's bow in prayer. Still our hearts, O oh God. There have been so many things that have taken our attention this week. Our minds have been worried about what we're going to eat, or we've been worried about things in the news that are bad news, or personal concerns about friends and family members, budget issues. There have been so many things that we've been thinking about. And during this next hour, we pray that you would just take our mind off of all those things and let us focus our gaze on you. 
And we see you most clearly when we look at your son, Jesus Christ. And he is the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Stand together and turn in your hymn books to our responsive reading, number 518. This is to all who believe. I will be a worship leader, and if you would follow suit with the bold print under worshipers, 518. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. We know that no one is justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes, from, comes through the message about Christ. I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Let's remain standing and turn back to 154. Sing our hymn of praise together. What a friend we have in Jesus. And yes, we do. Hymn number 154.
seated. Our uh, first scripture lesson today comes from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, if you didn't uh, bring your Bible, you can find it on page 1,756 of the Pew Bible, and I'll give you a second to find that. It's uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it is in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how, this was how the promise was stated, at the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. I'd now like to invite the children up for the children's sermon. Jeffrey, I want to ask you a question. I want you to be honest with me. 
Did you do anything to irritate her? No, Mom, I wasn't irritating her at all. <coughs> Mom said, I want you to think about it. You remember the game she was playing? And Jeffrey said, oh, yeah. I guess I irritated her a little bit when I moved the playing pieces in her game. And remember she was on the phone with her girlfriend, and what did you do? He said, well, I sort of interrupted her a little bit, started teasing her. And Mom said, you know what, I, I think it would be really good for you to forgive her, but I don't want to forgive her right now, because my eye still hurts. And then Mom said, do you remember the prayer we say at church sometimes, the Lord's Prayer? It says, forgive us our trespasses. And Jeffrey said, well, I didn't go in Mr. Smith's yard. I didn't trust that. <laughs> and Mom said, well, really that means all of our sins. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And your prayer to God said you're willing to forgive other people. And I want you to forgive your big sister. And you know, don't you hate it when your mom's just right sometimes? Yeah, I know. My mom's usually right too, even now. Now that I'm old, my mom is still right. How about that? But Jeffrey knew that mom was right. And so he went and he knocked on his sister's door. And she was sort of, you could still hear her crying a little bit. She didn't get hit, but she was crying because she realized she'd done something really nasty. They didn't she said, yeah. And Jeffrey said, sis, I want to come in because I want to forgive you. And the door opened up and she opened the door and he said, I want to forgive you for hitting me and I also want to apologize for irritating you this afternoon. And she said, thank you. And she opened her arms up and they gave each other a big hug. You know, sometimes we do nasty things to each other but sometimes we have to be forgiven. And that's the right thing to do. To give someone else to their hurt. <coughs> Father, I thank you for these children. And I hope that they never hit their brothers or sisters. But if they do, I pray that there'll be forgiveness for each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Time for some school children. <coughs> Let's take our hymnals and turn to hymn number 476 in the garden. Let's stand and we will sing together.
stay in the garden with him. Though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known let's bow in prayer Father, you have blessed us greatly in so many different ways. And one way is financial. You have given us financial gifts that put most of us far ahead of the average person around the world. And now you ask us to give back to you generously. You ask for a tithe, the tenth of what we receive. So we can give it back to you that your church and your kingdom might prosper. Give us generous hearts, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you, choir, very much. Those of you who attend regularly know that we are in what book of the Bible? Romans. Romans. So let me ask you to turn to uh, Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. We'll really be looking at chapters 9 through 11 today. That's all one piece. But I'll read for now Romans 11, 11 through 15. If you forgot your Bible, open a pew Bible. It is on page 1760. And I'll invite you to read along. Paul writes, Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? This is the word of God for the people of God. Today, uh, many people that do come to church They've been away for a while, or maybe they've never been in church at all. We might call them seekers. If they begin to read their Bibles, uh, they often turn to what testament to start reading in? What would you guess? Uh, the New Testament, uh, m most of them. I'm sure there's exceptions. But uh, a lot of people start in the New Testament. And quite honestly, if I have a seeker come to me and say, Pastor, I've never read in the Bible before. Where should I start? I often encourage them to start in the New Testament, 
particularly the Gospel of Luke is my favorite place to start, but one of the Gospels, get right to Jesus, let's find out who he is and what he did and what he taught, and let's find out about the crucifixion and the resurrection. I think you've got to get to the heart of the Christian faith right away. But after you've been a Christian for a while, how many of you have been Christians for at least a decade? Raise your hand. Lots of you. Lots of you. After you've been a Christian for a while, your Bible reading needs to extend to the Old Testament as well as the New. The Old Testament gives you all the background about what God was doing. I mean, he didn't just plop Jesus down by accident. It wasn't a last second thought. God had this plan for a very long time. And the Old Testament lets us know what God was doing and how he was creating a people for himself and how he was planning to send a Messiah first to them, the Jewish people, and then to all the other non-Jewish people. And the Bible has a word for the non-Jews. It's what? Gentiles. That's the, the Jewish word for everybody else. It's like the Americans have a word for everyone who's not an American. They're a what? No, no, not necessarily. The word for all of the ones who are not Americans is foreigner. A foreigner. They might be immigrants, they actually included, but people in France, Japan, Brazil, if we want one name for all of them together, they're foreigners. And the Jewish people had one name for everybody who wasn't Jewish, and that name was Gentile. And so the Old Testament lets us see what God was up to, starting with the Jewish people, but then with glimpses of reaching out to the Gentiles. And then, of course, we had the famous conversion of Paul, the, the strict Jew who hated the early Christians, who comes to know Christ on the road to what city? Damascus, on the road to Damascus. And he, is, he confronts the risen Christ, the resurrected Christ, and, and Paul becomes a believer. But God says, even though you're Jewish, and you're the strictest of all Jews, you're a Pharisee, Paul, I want you to have a special calling to the Gentiles, to all the non-Jews. And this is at a time when the early church was like 98 or 99 percent Jewish Christian. All the, all the 12 disciples of Jesus, you know, Peter and James and John, they were all Jewish. And all, almost all the people that followed Jesus to Jerusalem and were there at the crucifixion, almost all of them are Jewish. And so the whole early church is filled up with Jewish Christians. But then a few Gentiles began to come to Christ. And God converts Paul and says, I want you, Paul, to go to the Gentiles and take the gospel to them. Probably because Paul had grown up in Tarsus. It's in what we call Turkey today, not in Jerusalem. And he knew the Greek language. He was fluent in it. In fact, he was a Roman citizen even. And so he had entree to the whole Roman world in a way that a lot of Jews wouldn't have. And, and God gave him this missionary assignment. And he's been writing to the church at Rome. And now he comes to chapters 9, 10, and 11. They all are really one piece, one consistent piece addressing this issue about Jews and Gentiles. And I want you to listen for the emotion in Paul's words, starting back at Romans 9, 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And we begin to say, well, wh why is he so upset? What, what has Paul so upset? And in chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, we begin to get some sense about it. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites, and the Israelites, that's another name for who? The Jews. My heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. He's talking about his own people, the Jewish people. Now, some of you would say, wait, wait, I thought Paul was converted from Judaism to Christianity on the road to Damascus. Well, not really. Paul certainly became a Christian on the road to Damascus. But he never gave up being Jewish. Even in Romans, you read, when he talks about the Jewish people, he says, we Jews. That's the first person, 
plural. Okay? If I say, we Americans, that implies that I'm a what? American. I'm an American. Okay? We means plural. Us. I'm including myself. Paul says, we Jews. He is a Jewish Christian. His whole Christian ministry is as a Jewish Christian reaching out to the Gentiles. But he has a dilemma. Let's just imagine for a moment that God begins to speak in your heart, whether you're a young adult or middle-aged or even if you're a senior, and God begins to call you and you sense a calling to be a missionary. And maybe you're a, you've got a job, you're an IT specialist, and there's an opening. Your company says, we, we're going to open a new office in Beijing. We think there's a lot of Chinese we can sell our product to, like a, a billion of them. And uh, we want you to go and lead the way. And you begin to put these two things together. And eventually you sense, I'm going to go as a businessman or businesswoman to do IT work in Beijing. But I'm going to also spread the gospel there. And let's say you leave Haymarket and you go to Beijing. And you stay there for a decade. And, and your IT business goes great. Pretty soon everybody in China is buying your company's product. You're doing well. But also... You hook up with other Christians there, and you, you help spread the gospel, and, and the church you're a part of, it, it begins to grow and grow, and Chinese right and left are coming to Christ. You even have some minor government officials who've been communists who decide they, they reject communism, they accept Christ, and you just see great blessings on the mission field, and Chinese all over the place are becoming Christians, and then you come back to Haymarket 10 years later, and the church that you were part of is one-third the size it used to be. Now, are you still happy about the gospel growing in China? Well, of course! God's blessing your ministry in great ways. But do you still have a heart for the people you grew up with? Yeah, and you're concerned that the gospel's not growing there. That, that's what happens to Paul. He has a mission to the Gentiles... And it's going great. He started churches in Corinth and in Ephesus and Thessalonica and Philippi. And, and their churches growing all over the place. Now they have problems. And Paul has to write letters to them. That's why we have a letter to the Ephesians. And why we have a letter to the Philippians. And two letters to the Corinthians. They had lots of problems in Corinth. <laughs> he had to send two letters to them. And that's going great. And Paul's thrilled about it. But he has seen the great growth of the church in Gentile areas. But at the same time, he has noticed that fewer and fewer and fewer of those who are Jewish have come to accept Christ. When he started, the church was 98% Jewish Christians with just a couple little Gentiles mixed in. And now, because of his work and the work of others, it's not just Paul by himself, Barnabas is out there. There are other Christians telling the Gentiles about Christ. The Gentile numbers are growing greatly. But more and more Jews are saying, eh, not interested in Jesus. No interest in Jesus. Don't come to our synagogue, Paul, because you're going to cause trouble. None of us want to hear about that Jesus fellow. We still have the temple in Jerusalem, and we still have the Torah, the scriptures, and we don't need a Messiah. So don't come. And that begins to bother Paul greatly. And so when he sits down and he writes the letter to the Romans, he's talking about his understanding of the faith and how both Jews and Gentiles are sinners. That was what he talked about in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And then he talked about the great thing that all can come to faith in Christ. And that's what he he launches into, and then what it's like to be a Christian, and the challenges, the struggles. And in chapter 7, about all of us still struggle with sin, even Paul. But chapter 8, we looked at it last week, about the wonderful thing is that what can separate us from the love of God? The answer is nothing. Nothing. Can, so he's talking about all this. But now he comes to the point when he says, I, I need to address something that's really been bothering me. Because the church in Rome has Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians both in it. And he spends three full chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, talk about the view of the Jewish people and, and why, why God is permitting it to be that many of the Jews are now not interested in 
becoming Christians. You know, in Christian history, there have been three major views about how Christians see Jewish people. View one is that the Jews killed Christ and so God hates them. And maybe even if I need to take a gun to the local synagogue, I could go kill the Jewish people because they deserve it. And we saw that view in its most extreme form this week in Pittsburgh. That's a horrible view and completely opposite to anything I read in my New Testament. Not only in Paul's letters, but on any of the New Testament writings. But there have been plenty of Christians that had that view. Another view, view I'll call it view number two, is that the Jewish people have a separate covenant and they're saved by the Old Testament covenants even if they don't believe in Jesus as Messiah. And that's a very common view among mainline Christians. And then view number three, that God loves Jews and Gentiles both, but has sent the Messiah for Jews and Gentiles both. And uh, view number three is clearly Paul's understanding. Paul is still a Jewish Christian. And he makes it clear. If we look at chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, he struggles with the issue. Talking about his Jewish people, he said, Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Meganoito. Heck no. No way. But rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and if their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? Paul is still hoping that things will turn around and that more Jewish people will come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now the truth is, most Jews today do not believe in, in Jesus. But some of them do. How many of you have heard about the huge church in McLean called McLean Bible Church? Okay, their very fine pastor, Lon Solomon. Does that sound like a Jewish name to you? Lon Solomon grew up as a secular Jew. A secular Jew is one who says, I'm Jewish, and then I'm pro-Israel. Well, I've got no interest in God or the, the Jewish traditions, and I'll have a ham sandwich with you. And all that stuff's irrelevant, uh, but I'm pro-Israel. That's a secular Jew, no, not a religious Jew. That's, he grew up somewhat like that. And went off to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And then he ran into Christians who didn't say, oh, you're Jewish, I don't care about you. But ran into Christians who had view number three, like Paul. And said, Lon, God loves you greatly. He sent the Messiah for the Jewish people. And we, even though we're Gentile Christians, we're following the Jewish Messiah. You've seen the bumper sticker before, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. And that was their view. That was their view. And they said, and God loves you, Lon Solomon, and, and, but you're a sinner, you need to come to Christ. And Lon Solomon came to Christ, became a Jewish Christian. Now, he never gave up being Jewish. And neither did Paul or Peter. They didn't give up being Jewish. They became Jewish Christians. And that's what happened to Lon Solomon. And then God raised him up and he led a great, uh, took a little church about the size of Haymarket, and thousands of people came to Christ under Lon Solomon's preaching. And it became a great, great church. God still uses Jewish people. When I was in Virginia Beach, we had a nearby synagogue in Norfolk, Beth Messiah. The whole synagogue was made up of Jewish people. Christians. Next spring, for Holy Week, we're going to have a Passover Seder service. That's the Jewish meal they have to honor the Old Testament festival of Passover. When the angel of death passed over the Israelite homes in, in Egypt, I'm going to have a Jewish Christian friend of mine who does Seder services every year. She's going to come and lead us with a Passover Seder service. There are Jewish Christians today. And Paul's belief and hope was that Jewish people everywhere would come to know Jesus Christ 
as Lord and Savior. His view was that God has always loved the Jewish people. And there are times when the Jewish people have gone astray, but God has always kept for himself a, a remnant. We see it in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Paul says, It's not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. But indeed, God always keeps at least a remnant. We call this remnant theology. Elijah in the Old Testament pointed that out when most people, most of the Jews had become unfaithful. God said, Elijah, you're not the only one left. There's 7,000 who have not dropped the knee to Baal. 7,000 in the remnant who are faithful. In Isaiah 10, 21, it says, a remnant will return. And Paul's point is, only those Jews who believe in Jesus, those are the true Israel. And I still have a hope, says Paul, that they will come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. The Jewish Messiah. We wouldn't understand any of this unless we've read at least some of the Old Testament. And then we turn to Romans and we begin to look at, if you look in your footnotes, most of your Bibles have footnotes when there's an Old Testament quote. Notice how often Paul quotes the Old Testament. It's very, very common for him. He, he lives in Scripture. You know, at a time when all of us can afford Bibles, I mean, you can get a Bible for less than 10 bucks. Uh, and in fact, most, how many of you own more than one Bible at your home? Look at that. We've got them all over the place. I even have many Bible translations on my iPhone, right here. In Paul's day, that wasn't true. You would have to be a mega wealthy person in the time of Paul or Jesus to have a complete collection of scrolls of the entire Old Testament. Because all of those were put on papyrus or sometimes vellum, leather, that's really expensive, but even papyrus was expensive, and you had to do it by hand. And you would, you would have to hire a scribe unless you had handwriting as neat of a, as a scribe. How many of you have super neat handwriting? Your friends tease you about having real neat handwriting. Raise your hand. Go ahead and admit it. There's a few of you. That, one, two, three, four. Someone who won't admit it, Karen, Karen, <coughs> Karen um, but has neat and hope oh, there's seven. So, but most of the, how many of you have messy handwriting? I got my hand. Up. So all of us would have to hire those one of those six people to neatly write on a scroll. You'd have to get access to someone else's scroll. Maybe your local synagogue would have one. And you would buy a papyrus roll and you would pay a scribe, one of six people in our congregation with neat handwriting, and they would carefully write down every word in order with no erasers, yeah, they didn't, and you kids, no, no computers, no backspace, no, you know, clip and post or anything like that. By hand, it was very expensive. So all the more amazing that Paul knew his Old Testament this well. But he did. And he went over it. Wherever he was that he had access to a, a scroll, he read it and tried to memorize it. And then when he wrote his letters, he referred back many times to the Old Testament. He said, God hasn't given up on the Jewish people yet. He wants all people to be saved. But as Jesus himself said, it's a narrow gate. It's not a path that everybody's going to choose. We call all people, Jews and Gentiles, to faith in the Jewish Messiah. And those of us who are Gentile Christians, and that's certainly most of us here, Paul says, you guys are sort of like a, a separate branch of a tree that a horticulturalist cuts off and then grafts into a, a really special tree. All the Gentiles are like that branch that's been grafted in. And we need to be thankful for that tree we're grafted into, which is the tree of Judaism. The, the tree that goes back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because we draw from that tree. And he said it's true that many Jews in Paul's day now are not accepting Christ. But Paul hasn't given up on them yet. He wants both Jews and Gentiles to come to faith 
in Jesus Christ. And so the great verses in Romans 10, and many of you that, that read the Roman road of salvation, remember these two verses, they were part of that Roman road of salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. And that is the message that Paul had for the church at Rome. And it's the message that Paul has for the church at Haymarket. A message that Jesus Christ died for all people around the whole world, both Jews and Gentiles, Americans, Chinese, Brazilians, and Nepalese, all over the world, these are people that God cares about and loves and wants them to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And here at the end of our service, we give people an opportunity to make a profession of faith in Christ. If you've never done that, that is how you are saved. And if you're already a Christian and you've been visiting Haymarket Baptist for months now, maybe God is nudging you and have said, this is where I want you to make your church home. And if that's you, maybe today is the day for you to step forward, the time for you to step forward, to move your membership to our church. We're going to sing an invitation song. It's our hymn number 358. I'll ask all of you to turn to 358, and we'll stand and let's sing together. Please stand.
Father, we thank you for the Old Testament. We thank you for the Jewish roots of our faith. And we lift up all of those families at the synagogue in Pittsburgh and pray that you might bring a healing and comfort to those people and remind Christians everywhere that we need to love our Jewish brothers and sisters. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen.